I'm sitting here with Taylor McCandless. Taylor is a medical social worker. She's been doing this for 20 plus years. She also happens to be a dear friend and a respected colleague of mine. She currently is working at Kaiser, where she's doing working with chronically, long-term chronically ill people, especially around palliative care. What we're going to be talking about today and why I've asked her to come share some of this is because she has real world experience. It's more than just about filling out the paperwork and thinking you're done. So we're going to share some experiences. Names are protected. We don't want to share uh, information about people who can be identified, but you're going to get the gist of this. Taylor, is there anything I missed that I should say? Or that you want people to know? Uh, well, what I would like people to know is the reason I enjoy my job so much is that I've had opportunities to champion advanced care planning countywide in Sonoma um, as part of a county initiative, and that really crystallized for me. It was very popular after a book named Being Mortal came out, and there was a bit of a fanfare, and there was funding, and now there's not funding. <laughs> And we're all back to kind of figuring it out in our own way. And I love to work with groups and individuals to do that. I work with a lot of individuals coping with figuring out what's really going to happen. So in addition to her work that she does at Kaiser, she is also available for one-on-one -on -one consulting. And we'll mm -hmm. share her information with you after the program today. So if you need to, you can follow up. Um, the title of this talk, Taylor, is why you shouldn't have a relative be on your durable power of attorney for health care forms or you or not going to be on your pulse form because that's for the physician to do. But um, what I'm hoping we can actually talk about is a little of, the, of why I say that, and you can argue against me if you don't believe <laughs> that. Um, I spent five years uh, in a former career, I guess it was a career, it was five years, I've been an estate planning paralegal, and mm -hmm. I wrote over hun hundreds of wills and trusts, right. and had people fill out durable powers of attorney for healthcare. And I got to tell you, we never talked about the challenge of having somebody actually fulfill this. It was just sign on the dotted yeah. line, date it, and make sure people can find it. What's been your real life experience with people actually having to either enforce or figure out what to what do to once do. this happens? Yeah. Well, the, um, the interesting aside is the forms have evolved and many of them now contain a brief clause that doesn't need to be witnessed, it's not part of the legal standing of the form, where the agent acknowledges the role. Which means that someone has to show their agent the paperwork. And that's a, actually a really important step because the paperwork is not the thing that shows up at the doctor, the person is. Yeah. And um, the reason picking an agent that isn't by definition needs to be a relation is because you need someone who has the fortitude to show up and face what will feel like an adversarial role possibly and know how to focus on your wishes. And So that kind of assumes that not just you have a conversation saying, hey, Taylor, I want you to be my attorney in fact. But, hey, Taylor, this is what I want to have happen mm -hmm. if something happens to me. Yeah. Is that an easy conversation for people to have? No, on both sides. You know, I, even when people want to have that conversation, they will uh, approach their person or their adult child and say, I want to talk about this. And they oh, you're fine. You're doing great. Don't worry about a thing. I'll deal with it. You know, it's never going to happen. Well, in reality, it's always going to happen. We all die. Yeah. And... Um, the statistics, I don't think they've changed much since I last looked into us, but 75% of us will die in a hospital, even though the reverse amount of us say we would prefer to die at home, right? So right. we say we want to die at home when we end up in a hospital setting. And that's for a lot of reasons around anticipating and care at the end of life. So, so one of the things that I have found is a point of confusion for a lot of people is they filled out the paperwork, but they don't really understand where these intersections are. Like, with the post, that's mm -hmm. something, it's a doctor's order. Right. So who has to follow doctor's orders? Licensed medical people. So even in my role as a medical social worker, I always am certified for CPR because anybody in the state of California living in the community or at the store or you know on the plaza 
you know, having a picnic will get CPR unless they have a line, a signed legal document with them saying don't. And you so whip it's that a, out, of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, and the, well, some people get the medical alert bracelet with DNR on it, which is valid um, and recognized by EMS. Um, but for the most part, we all get the dwindles. And it's this slow iterative process where the people don't recognize that things are really starting to brew and take enough action to say, this is a good moment to contact all those people that are my people and make sure they're on board with my current health and where I am. What I find is a lot of folks um, have someone that they're in contact with that's important in their life, but that doesn't mean they know how their days are going and they don't know how hard it is to get up every day and what's changed in their lives. They just say, well, you're looking great at the last picnic or family reunion or whatever, and they're mapping to that person. So a document that says who, but also clearly identifies what you consider to be acceptable outcomes. And that's the piece that's missing, especially in a lot of estate planning documents. So as a psychologist, when I've been working with people, oftentimes I'll talk to one of my patients and say, hey, let's have a conversation with the person you want to have. Bring them in. Let's mm -hmm. all of us sit down and talk about this because the conversation is difficult. Yeah. And not that you need a professional to help you with it, but mm -hmm. uh, just feeling comfortable enough to say to the person, look, I'm trusting you to make a decision about my life. How does that make you feel? Right. And because I think it's both and, right? Mm -hmm. And I love this term dwindles that you <laughs> The use. dwindles, yeah. Um, my husband had a chronic disease. He had kidney failure. And we had a DNR. It was very clear that he didn't want anything done. Right. But he had to go into the hospital. Because mm. We thought he was just going to be treated for kidney failure. Right. Well, he got into the hospital and things did not go well. Uh, and when he got there, they asked him, do you want your DNR to hold still? And he said, no, because he's I'm figuring, here to be treated, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly, right. Yeah. And unfortunately, he was unable to revisit that because his medical condition did not allow him. He lost, he lost competency. He lost his ability right. to make decisions yeah. for himself. And things just got worse from right. then on. So it did not go as planned. And even though I was the person who was right. on that list. I felt the challenge of standing up and saying, primarily because his kids had not been consulted. Mm. And I felt strongly that they should have something to say about their yeah. father's health. Yeah. And um, we did not have a good result out of mm. all of this. And if, that sounds... the reason why I even come up with this conversation for people is because I regret to this day that my husband wasn't able to die with dignity. And mm -hmm. that yeah. was the goal. Right, absolutely. So have you seen situations yes. where it's worked and where it hasn't worked and can you share? Well, I, I have, um, when I counsel people about picking their person, I always say, you know, this we're forcing a medical hierarchy onto a decision that's gonna feel like it's a committee decision. Family, you need support when you're supporting your husband in the hospital, right? So suddenly that's at least one more person. Maybe there's two more people and maybe there's someone who thinks they even have equal standing with you. And so suddenly it's a committee. And so what this in kind of artificial legal hierarchy does is it says, when it comes to a major decision, all that goes away and they're looking right at you. So you being comfortable with the expectation is really important but everyone else being informed of what their roles are is equally important. Yeah. So when I talk about planning for legal incapacity, because when I work with people with serious illness, frequently there is an impending um, time when their dementia is going to overtake their ability to participate in their care anymore. So you wanna kind of get a lot of groundwork done, but you're anticipating who's that group that's gonna show up. And then identifying for the primary decision maker or healthcare agent or surrogate or proxy, the million names we have for this role, who's not involved? So your cousin who always turns up and always has something to say about everybody, you can add that in your directive and no Mildred. <laughs> and that's important to some people yeah. to empower you. To, so it's important to negotiate your document in a way that says, does this tell you about who I want to support you in this role and who I don't want involved and, and make that clear. But what happens for families that want to operate um, as a committee or who find out that they're in fact not the primary decision maker, which happens sometimes where they do have a friend in that role 
<clears throat> but the kids are the doing the day to day and they've assumed all the boots on the ground work. And then they hit the hospital and the hospital says, that's great. I'm really, you've been taking really good care of your mom. But um, now I'm talking to Josephine and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah. And, and hospitals are accommodating in terms of taking time. If the, well, given that there's time, um, you know, to get everybody around the table and explain, this is what we have to do. We have to recognize a legally designated decision maker. Um, and try and get everybody's points of view heard enough that the decision makers operating with all the information. The thing that's hard is frequently, and I'm sorry for what happened with your husband, but frequently we brush up against medical crisis after medical crisis and we don't stay in the hospital long enough to be forced to figure it out. Yeah. So it goes back into the community and then there's no facilitation, there's no goal of a hospital saying we want everyone to understand the process suddenly you're at home with lots of people coming at you who have opinions that are hurt there's resentments that come up there's family dynamics that come up well and I mean, we're talking about this because both of us have experienced this mm -hmm. and for most people the first time they encounter this is in that point right where they're in an unfamiliar situation with unfamiliar mm -hmm. people and certainly I've run up against this, where people just assume somebody else is going to take care of it. And even though they've finished with the paperwork, for example, they assume yeah. that some doctor's going to come in and make the decision for them or tell right. them what to do. Mm -hmm. And as you're pointing out here, the, the dynamics, the family dynamics right. that can go on. What do you do about somebody who doesn't die in the hospital, gets discharged home mm -hmm. for a while, and then maybe comes back. Yeah. Well, the recognized decision maker doesn't change even if it was a very contentious or disputed role. Until that paperwork changes, it's still the same person. People, occasionally I have people revoke who realize that they it's more than they wanted. The most compassionate thing that I've seen happen that I thought was lovely is that the verbally the spouse said, I know what needs to happen. I believe it's the right thing. I don't want to say it. So I'm going to revoke and let my son, who's the alternate power of attorney, say it because I want it to happen, but I don't want to ask for it. Wow. And that was beautiful because they yeah. figured it out how to do it without making it a, she wasn't resisting the decision. She just didn't want to literally say the words. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so touching. Yeah. And it that's was touching. because, and I think that's the thing you're asking of a person when you ask them to do it, to say, imagine that my brain's gone and I can't move and I can't talk and I'm bloody and on a bed and I've told you this is what I want. Is that comfortable for you to do that? And people have a hard time envisioning this. I was talking with um, some other facilitators this morning and they were saying, well, I haven't worked with young people. It seems like a really strange decision making process to have with young people. I'm like, I love working with young people because they're really facing 60 years of a medical future where some weird thing happens, you know, death by oak tree or you're in a, you know, the bus hits you, the joke, you know, they're really just saying some future unexpected medical thing will happen to me. And who are my people? Yeah. And it's a pretty easy decision. And you say, go back and revisit that every 10 years or upon a dilemma. So divorce, dilemma, I'm just trying to remember all the D's without my, <laughs> without my prompt cards. Um, divorce is important to recognize in California. If you have an existing document and you divorce, that person is not allowed to be even if they're your only agent on your form, yeah. they are not allowed to do that role unless you do a new form with a post-divorce the signature date yeah. where you you know voluntarily nominate them. So they, they become just automatically revoked. But then you can have dilemmas. I've had people say, I have my friend, she's lovely. It's gone really well. We've been best friends for 35 years. We're always on the same page. She knows who my doctor is. She knows what's wrong with me and not wrong with me. It's all great. But then she just put her dog through living hell for six months and didn't put it down. Yeah. And I can't trust her to be my agent anymore. And that was compassionate because they recognized this is too much to ask of the friend. The friend was a great one for those many years where something out of the blue might happen. Yep. But as you're approaching and we've created chronic illness by living so long. It's good, <laughs> right? We like it. A good day is we woke up. Yeah. But in, in effect, we are now living into hypertension and living into heart disease, even if we're marathon runners and do everything right. 
And so we have to be prepared to talk about what chronic illness means for what I now perceive as living well and redo that advanced directive every 10 years and check back in with the people. So two things come up around what you're talking about here. One is that some of us may outlive the people that we Absolutely. expect to take care of us. And not all of us have family. There are mm -hmm. many choices, um, particularly since June is Pride Month, where reason are, are still there are really archaic laws around where yeah. people may be living together in a committed partnership, but they do not have legal standing. Mm -hmm. So are there particular steps that you can take to protect that? Or are, I don't mean to throw you on the... No, no, the that's, here, that's one of my concerns is you want people, that's when I say your people, I'm saying that specifically because your family may not be your people. Yeah. <laughs> and you may not have a formalized chosen family that's a new blended thing that's recognized with marriage certificates and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, you can do everything right and still come up against a system that's full of bias. I had a, um, an actually uh, cisgender heteronormative couple um, where the woman is um, f was failing and her lifetime partner, and they chose to not marry very righteous out of the 70s about not doing that. And, you know, they lost some control, I think, just because the powers that be gave more deference to the bloodline of the daughter because there wasn't a marriage certificate and I had to go back and back to the trust to say no this is this her living partner her partner is it's if it's her spouse I started you know, like referring to him as spouse just to kind of and it's still it, it got contentious and ended up in court even wow. though it was a full living trust properly executed all of it it's still it was the first time I've been subpoenaed for a conservatorship hearing so, so what I'm hearing is that we can do the planning and we can have papers in place. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, as one of my mentors once said to me, all of us are surprised when we die. Right. And it, things may not go the way we planned or I've planned or I've right. hoped. Um, so I'm now dead and my relatives are left with all of this. Is there any follow-up that's typically done after the person has died to like offer support or help? To... Well, this is why I'm such a big proponent of hospice is that there's good evidence-based outcomes of reduced complicated depression um, for people and families that are involved with hospice care. So ideally there would be a hospice involved and that would extend services to the family and ongoing bereavement. Um, you can ask for those things outside in the community, but no, the most startling thing that happens when someone dies is the power of attorneys instantly void. Your role is over and it's whoever is the executor or it's a probate question and that becomes it's another baby altogether. So the ability to um, have all those pieces in place, a signer on a checking account that has monies for your funeral arrangements so that when the power of attorney is over if you're not a signer on an account, who has money to take care of your remains? All those things become problems yeah. if it's not thought out in advance. And it's nothing, you know, it's kind of gruesome to talk about. But I see so much more potential for happier relationships and better outcomes for patients by talking about it in advance. And that is um, something you might have to push for. I'm a big proponent and, and hope that people will do dinner parties and and just talk about it. You know, th those go wish cards, sometimes people are, are shy about it, but even just having random scenarios that you throw out that you saw this in a movie and what would you do? And just kind of talk it through. I have a, a woman that I worked with as part of that um, coalition said that one of, she brought it up at Christmas, which was very <laughs> unexpected and not welcome but the the gem she got was her dad said I don't want to talk about it I just want tulips she was like you're my marine father all you care about is tulips, tulips. and it gave her something to hold on to I believe there were a lot of tulips at his I think celebrations I, I look back with this with a great deal of humor but also a great deal of empathy um, this job that I had as an estate planning paralegal, we had a very, very wealthy client who literally used to come in once a month. Mm. And these were the, this was back in the days where we didn't have phones. And so right. we had Polaroid pictures of all of her belongings. <laughs> and it literally took up three ring binders, multiple, multiple binders. binders. Right. And she would come in and she would go through each and every one of them and write on the back who she wanted this thing to go to. But she could not have a conversation about mm. 
her own wishes for her own death, and she died alone. And that really got me thinking about the importance of starting the conversation early. And we need to rehearse it. It's not an easy thing to no, talk about. Yeah. And approaching it, I love this idea of having a dinner party and just, you know, ask, ask an open-ended question about, yeah. you know, what would happen if, or, um, you know, however that would go. And revisiting it. And I hear you say, and certainly most of the documents suggest every few years or so, I would encourage it even sooner because, again, we're mm -hmm. always surprised when it well, happens. Well, those of us in the, in, in the industry would say yearly, but no administration wants to pay for that level of attention. And people get annoyed. But, you know, when you go into your flu shot, stop and say, is whoever, is my document actually current? Did that person just move and no longer wants to be a part that doesn't want the responsibility? You know, and just think about it. So on your flu shot, it's a it's an opportunity to go. Can you tell me who's on my record? Is is the paper? Can you see that paperwork? You know, and depending where you're getting your flu shot, they'll have time to do that or not. So, Safeway won't be able to do that for you, right? Yeah, that's true. But, um, but this also brings up if you don't have the paperwork in place, what do you do? Where can you get a pulse? How do you mm. create a durable power of attorney for healthcare? Right. So those are wildly available in terms of the durable power of attorney for healthcare. And I can throw out some websites or maybe you can attach them to your presentation. Sure. I have a long list of them um, because no form is universally right. And in California, we recognize multiple forms. So you can find a form that reflects your wishes. So I'm, I'm hearing that you don't have to hire a lawyer to do this. Absolutely not. And, it, and I caution you, and, and the whole reason I've even made myself available is for individual counseling about this is that people do that as a chapter where they're talking about their stuff and they are very worried about their stuff and they're not in a mindset about outcomes and what happens if I no longer recognize myself or the people that love me? What kind of medical treatment do I want then if I've had a massive stroke? What if I am physically debilitated and need 24 hour care? Who do I want coordinating that? You know, they don't wanna talk about that. They're just thrilled that they've got the house signed over and the checks are updated and you know they're very focused on their stuff and I frequently have to say that to families when I say tell me what you want they go oh well I have a will and da 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 I said no I said I don't want to know about your stuff I want to know about what you want for yourself for your comfort your grace for the end of your days and what does that look like and that's when most people express the desire to die at home and that's definitely possible with chronic illness if you're out in front of it but if you're catching it and, and people are finding out late because you feel um, there's shame in our culture for whatever reason for illness. So if you're not telling people, look, I just got diagnosed with a congestive heart failure and my prognosis is okay now, but that's not, a, that's, I need to figure out what I'm going to do because I don't want to die X, Y, Z. And you have yeah. feelings about that. Um, so it's important to, you know, a, a diagnosis is a very good reason to revisit your forms and revisit the people that you've listed to see if they're comfortable with what the trajectory of that illness is because it's different for everybody. A lot of folks have heard about the End of Life Option Act and it's completely irrelevant if you've lost capacity. So let's, let's clear up some terms. Lost capacity doesn't mean you just have a few word searching problems. Right. It's a legal term that is often has to be determined on the spot mm -hmm. by whether or not you are capable of making decisions for yourself, right. which can be a very different standard than maybe is thought of in other cases. So we use the word to differentiate that. We use capacity to be kind of temporary in the moment. Does Mary have capacity today? because you're not like halfway over in your chair with a migraine where I'm pestering you about things, right? That's not a good day to ask you questions. But um, competency is that permanent thing where this person is no longer able to manage their affairs or understand what's, what's swaying in the balance, right? Because that's what medical consent is all about, the risks and the benefits. Yeah. And so um, every medical decision from a flu shot to open heart surgery has the same thing, you know? What's the risks of doing it? What's the benefits of doing it? And people can usually retain, and they influence me and the doctors that I'm, and nurse practitioners that I work with, when they'll say, well, they retain enough capacity to say who they want to represent them, but they're no longer able to kind of 
talk about this medicine versus that medicine. Yeah. That's too much detail. It's confusing. But I think the End of Life Option Act is a very specific law that came into effect that everyone thinks it will apply to them and their situation. And in fact, if you have any um, concerns about your lucidity, it's much harder to access that at the end of your life. And actually, it takes some front end planning because mm -hmm. you have to have an end date uh, to know that you can count backwards in order to make sure that you have uh, uh, Right, you have to have a, the six month or less medical certification saying that they yeah. believe, and it's a clinical decision and it's open to speculation. And it's right? open to change. And it will change, yeah. it absolutely will change. Yeah. Um, that's why hospice is so helpful. In fact, hospice will provide services to people who are exercising their right under the end of life act, but they don't participate in it at all. They're hands off because hospice is nothing to prolong nor hasten death. So one of the things that I've always felt uh, is important for people to know about hospice is that it doesn't just happen in the last week of life. You actually Ideally. have this, yeah, you actually have this six month window. Mm -hmm. And there are different hospices. There, there, there are nonprofit organizations usually. Right. Um, they can differ not so much in services, but in how you access their mm -hmm. services, depending on where you are. Yeah. So if you're not just here in the local Sonoma Valley area, where there are two hospices or three hospices that are uh, functioning up here, you, you might want to do some research ahead of time mm -hmm. on that. But I love what you're yeah. saying about them. Um, we probably should bring this to a little bit. We're almost at 30 minutes here. I was looking at that. Some takeaways. What what would be important for people who are listening to us today to think about in terms of what next steps as opposed to, you know, end steps they might want to yeah. check? What would be a couple of good ideas to do that they can do this week? Um, if you have an advanced health care directive, go read it. See what you checked. Uh, I frequently have people who check things. They're like, I can't believe I ever checked that. So you might just, you know, verify what it says this week yeah. and then decide, is it time for me to talk to my agent or agents? And can I talk to them together? Maybe on a Zoom if they're a little far flying and just revisit what you meant when you checked that and ask if they have any questions and open it up. And I think that's the main thing is it's you can, well, this is the joke that I always tell people is you can put, I'm trying to think who's contemporary because I'm, I'm old now. You can put Taylor Swift she does not have to show up, neither does Russell Crowe, right? So you want to pick people who will be pleased to show up and see that as something, not as an obligation, but as something they desire to do for you. So if it's out of obligation, talk more about what they do want to do, because there's roles for everybody. Somebody has to feed the cat. Somebody needs to notify the magazine subscriptions that are useless anymore. It took me two years to cancel my dad's Economist subscription. Yeah, I, was, I teased it was my inheritance. So, because it just would not stop. I think he'd renewed it three way. I, anyway, so you know, there's there's roles for everyone, and the um, once you're willing to approach your agent and say, can we just see if you have any questions and I want to talk about it again and check in. It's been a while, or before you put anybody down, go to them and say, this is what I'm thinking. This is how I'm going to fill out the form. What are your questions for me? I want to, you're doing me a favor, so let me get this right by you. What do you need to know to feel confident in this role? I am so, so grateful that I have you both as a friend and a colleague. <laughs> well, same, right? And I available to call on you for this sort of thing. This is a conversation that you can have, but you do have to initiate it. And it can be as wonderful as this conversation is today, just sitting down with a friend and talking about your hopes and desires. Taylor, thank you so much. Thank you.